welcome to this Aim High Live. Um, there are already loads of people in the chat. I'm gonna say hi to everyone. Jeff, hi. Hey, Max. Angel's here. Um, Pumpkin Master's here. Rebecca's here. Guys, welcome back um, to this Aim High Live. Uh, thank, thanks so much for coming. Uh, this one is gonna be about what are cryptocurrencies and are they the future? Um, so it's kind of about um, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of those kinds of things. Um, so also, I'm interested, I I'm wearing headphones now. Is my audio better or is it worse or is it the same? Um, and because, yeah, maybe I'll change change and do, do it differently sometime. Right. If you are watching on my Facebook or my YouTube, then as ever, you have to go here if you want to get the full calendar. Oh my God, there's a new um, website. It's It looks so good. It's been blowing my mind. Um, in fact, wait, I, I want to share, I want to show you what it looks like. Um, so yeah, today's going to be about what are cryptocurrencies and are they the future? But check out how good the new, this is what the new calendar looks like. So this is what's coming up after my live tonight. Hannah's doing, should doctors be paid the same as cleaners? How to tell the truth with lies? If you could choose, should you be female or male? And there's another one called Should Schools Ban Beef? And then I'm also doing GCC Electricity on Friday. Which ones are you most excited about? I'm interested. Um, oh, Angel likes the new format. <laughs> Max says it's fresh and spicy. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Um, but yeah. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, I'm interested to know which ones you're looking forward to most. But I am going to um, just poke them out to the side, just remote. Right. Um, yes, this is, uh, this is, uh, Aim High Live, so you can ask questions whenever you want. Uh, I'm going to talk about what are cryptocurrencies and are they the future, which is kind of science, kind of maths, kind of like combined. Um, and, uh, hopefully, uh, there will be some interesting bits along the way. Um, but yeah, if, if, if this is your first time joining, then know that you can ask questions whenever you want, like, and just, just throw in any comments that you want, even if it's really tangential, um, because I will just try and catch anything that I can out of the chat, um, if it, if it's fun and interesting. Um, and Angel's really excited about the one tonight about should doctors be paid the same as cleaners? Yeah, that's Hannah's one. I'm looking forward to that one too. Um, right. Actually, something really cool is happening, um, tonight, which means I won't be able to make the, the whole of Hannah's. Um, I don't know if you guys know, um, know Jane Goodall. Um, Jane, who knows who Jane Goodall is? Jane Goodall. I've also just realized I've hidden loads of the chat for myself, so I'm just going to like move it around. Come here, chat. <laughs> Let's be able to see you. Um, Angel knows who Jane Goodall is. Um, <coughs> and Jeff's birthday is on the 10th. Ah, Jeff's birthday coming up on the 10th. Get that on my calendar. Happy birthday, Jeff, coming up, Eve, Eve, Eve. Um, and yeah, Jane Goodall is, is the world's greatest expert on chimpanzees. She dedicated loads of her life to going and living with chimpanzees and, and showing people that they are so much more similar to us than most people thought. Um, she's an amazing woman. Anyway, I'm, I'm gonna interview her this afternoon, obviously via Zoom, because we can't go and hang out with one another, but, so I'll miss some of Hannah's, because um, I'm gonna chat, be chatting to Jane. Um, but uh, yeah, ooh, message notification, let's get on that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, okay, so, uh, oh, the pumpkin mask asking, did she teach the gorilla sign language? I don't think she taught the gorilla sign language, although that is such a cool thing that they taught a gorilla sign language. Okay, uh, quick, quick distracting point um, about the gorilla and the sign language. So the gorilla um, had a pet kitten. Um, I'm going to just draw like a, this would this be the gorilla. Obviously, as everyone now knows, I cannot draw. Um, so that'll be the gorilla. And the gorilla had a pet cat. Um, and they taught the gorilla sign language. And so the gorilla was able to string together basic kind of sentences. Um, anyway, one day, uh, the gorilla... Um, got very upset and the sink that was attached to the side of the um, of the, the enclosure because obviously the, the gorilla was captive um, which is not a good thing but anyway it was captive and, uh, and they were teaching it sign language um, it got very angry and it ripped the sink off the side of the enclosure wall and threw it onto the ground um, and what do you guys think it then signed what sign language did it use to 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 explain to um, the humans what had happened. What do you guys, what did the gorilla say? Um, have we got Gream? What did the gorilla say? 
Uh, anyway, I'm just going to catch up on what people are saying. Um, oh, Sean, that's such a nice comment. Thanks, mate. Um, and Toby's describing it as a lasagna flower. Um, and... And Angel, you might be right about that she may have been working with the gorilla who was able to do sign language. I'm not, I'm not sure if Jane did directly work with, with that gorilla because I know that Jane mainly specialised in chimpanzees. It was, it was someone else, like, oh, I've forgotten her name. She had like a Danish name or something, the, the person who, who worked with mountain gorillas. Because um, there, there were three amazing women who went to different parts of the world to study different primates. There were, there were Jane and this other woman who studied the chimpanzees and the gorillas um, in 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 africa and then there was one other woman who ah oh, it'll come to me leaky camp leaky is the name of the place camp leaky is this place in the middle of uh, borneo in indonesia where where they were studying chimpanzees and it, it was it used to be the kind of center of, of study of that kind of stuff and now and now that's become a bit of a tourist thing and it's a bit weird um but there's, there are very good research centers near there. But yeah, there are three amazing... If you want to check out the stories, there are three amazing women who went to different parts of the world to, to work with, with primates and, and Jane focused on, focused on chimpanzees. Um, top hats on both. Demands coming in. Uh, okay, so what the... Maybe I can ask Jane in the interview. It'd be a bit embarrassing if I didn't know if she'd been doing the ASL, so I probably will avoid exactly that topic. Um... <coughs> But uh, yeah, maybe I should ask her about some of those things that I just talked to you guys about. I will write that down. Um, uh, okay, you're right. You have inspired me to ask Jane another question. I'm going to do it. Um, for those, if you, if you want to see see the show, it'll all go out on Saturday night. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you all. I'll tell you all about it on Friday. But it's um, it's livemedaid.com. Um, is the is the thing that'll be it's all I'm a part of this thing raising money for um, for Doctors Without Borders livemedaid.com if you want to check it out um, anyway that's the thing that I'm doing I'm now going to stop talking about that and I'm going to go to cryptocurrencies which is what I'm supposed to be talking about you guys are so distracting anyway the thing that the gorilla signed to uh, the scientists was of course the cat broke the sink <laughs> <laughs> and the scientists were like, no, it didn't. Anyway, right. So the big question that I want to start with is this. Um, <laughs> Bailey's asking me to sing a song. No, you can hear me sing songs on Spotify if you go to Ashlad. Um, anyway, right. So uh, this flower is a, who knows what flower this is? Um, oh, Jeff's saying that you like my music. Thanks for saying you like my music, Jeff. That's very kind of you. Um, and uh, Angel's saying that in Switzerland there's a Jane Goodall Institute. Yeah, Jane Goodall, the Jane Goodall Institute spans around the world and the, the youth program is called Roots and Shoots. Jane Goodall is amazing. She's one of these really amazing people who, who you should check out for the, for the work that she's done throughout her life. It's very inspiring. She's a very, very inspiring human being. Um, Anyway, so um, I would, yeah, what is, what is this flower? What's going on with this flower and why is it stripy? Now, before you tell me um, why this flower, why is this flower stripy? I mean, do have guesses if you want. Um, why is this flower stripy? But your clue is this. <laughs> and this is not a very good clue, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. So there was a time in history, and this is all now coming around to cryptocurrencies, um, and currencies and whatnot. There was a time in history when this flower, which is called the Semper Augustus, don't look it up because that would be cheating. <laughs> um, so this this flower is called the Semper, or maybe it's Semper Augustus. I think it's Semper. Um, yeah, so this, this flower called the Semper Augustus, um, it was possible at one point in history to sell one of these flowers and buy a house. As in the flower at one point in history was so valuable that it was equal in value to, to a house. So yeah, you could trade it, trade it in for a place to live if you had one of these um, Semper Augustuses. Why do you think it was stripy and what is going on? Okay, Jeff is saying it's a tulip. It is a tulip. Um, Jeff's saying it was worth even more money. Um, 
So Jasmine is saying maybe you can crossbreed them to get stripes, and actually it's not that. Um, Mears is saying that stripes often ward off predators in nature, and that's a really smart point, but that is not what's going on here. Um, and uh, Toby's asking how much was the house worth? It was worth a Semper Augustus. Obvi, in brackets, I don't know. But, like, it's because it was, it was at the point when you could buy a house with it, it was quite far back in history, and so we'd have to convert it to modern-day money, which I haven't done. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, someone painted it for fun? No. Um, and Rebecca's saying, maybe it only bloomed once a few years. Great idea, but that's not what it... it wait, Jeff didn't say what? Oh, uh, okay, Jeff's confused. Uh, and Bailey's asking about maybe for medicine. Right. Okay, so let me tell you the story of this flower. So there was a crazy time in history um, called the tulip bubble. Um, and the tulip bubble is something that happened in the Netherlands. Uh, and some of you may have already heard of this. Um, but basically what happened was it was it was around the time that people had started like trading um, stocks and shares and things like that and, and money had started to to be more of a like marketplaces were evolving in in a in a new and crazy way uh, leading to the kind of crazy systems we have now um, anyway there was this strange time when tulips started to increase in price and a single tulip went up from being um, one I can't remember what the currency was at the time um, but one unit of currency up to about 10 and people were like whoa that's pretty that's pretty expensive tulip um, but then it just stayed at 10 and because it stayed at 10 gradually creeping up people started buying more of them thinking we'll sell them later and make more money um, or they started buying tulip based resources so they'd start investing in farms that grew tulips or they'd start um, investing in shops that sold tulips and gradually, rather than this being a kind of sane thing where everyone was like, okay, the price of tulips is getting pretty high, instead, people started to think, well, you know, if I, if I buy a load of shares in all these tulip things, then next year it's going to be worth even more. And they were right. And so they told their friends, and their friends were like, oh, God, yeah, we should buy tulips as well. And they all bought tulips. And it became this mad, mad word of mouth thing where everyone just kept buying more and more tulips until eventually, in 1936, the price of tulips went up from 20 to 50 in a fraction of a year. And everyone was like, oh, my God, we've got to buy more tulips. And then there was a bit of a dip when the price kind of crashed out a bit. Um, and then suddenly... Whoosh, you could sell tulips for 200 units of whatever the currency was. Um, and Toby's saying it backwards inflation, maybe. I, I want to... I just wanted to catch up on that. Oh, no, there haven't been too many comments about this. Um, so this is the kind of mad thing that happens with the financial systems that we have built, where sometimes, because it's human nature to kind of communicate a good idea, like a meme spreading, because, um, yeah, a meme, obviously we think of memes as like funny things on the internet, but actually meme, the word, is just an idea that spreads. So this was essentially a meme. The idea that you could make huge amounts of money from just buying tulips and just or, or tulip-based assets like farms and things and just holding on to your shares for a few days and then selling them off again and so the price just went up and up and up and up and up and up and up until eventually all of the smart people or well I say smart it wasn't even necessarily the smart people it was just people who might have been more in the know or a bit more risk averse pulled out all their money um, and, and made a huge amount of money for themselves and then suddenly the whole population of the Netherlands, everyone in the Netherlands is like holding stocks in tulips. They've invested their life savings into it and suddenly it all, the price completely crashes and no one wants to buy any tulips or tulip stocks anymore. Um, anyway, so... Uh, yeah, and, and, there, and loads of people lost huge amounts of money where some people made a huge amount of money. Anyway, so that's the tulip bubble. Now, I'm going to talk about... Um, cryptocurrencies in a second but I just want to tell you one more thing about the Semper Augustus that I found out because it's bloody interesting and that's the answer to why is this flower stripy um, and people during especially during the tulip bubble tried everything to make their flowers stripy they were like let's pour certain kinds of manure on the fields or let's like try and put like specific dyes onto the fields like red and white dye and hope and, and nothing worked um, 
I'm just gonna see if anyone has any more ideas about why it might be stripey and also just do a last a late welcome to anyone who's joined part way through this um, just to say I'm going to talk about cryptocurrencies and are they the future and I have been talking about tulips for probably far too long but it was because really interesting anyway I'm going to switch to cryptocurrencies in a moment and bitcoin and stuff um, but if you are joining for the first time thanks so much for joining uh, this is aim high so I'm just talking about science and stuff um, and do do get involved in the chat um, okay so Sigto is saying maybe it's a genetic mutation um, Max is saying maybe it's it's genetically modified and that's how it it got these stripes um, Jasmine's saying why were they buying tulips and it it's I mean that's one of the crazy things about the bubble is the idea that there was no reason to buy these tulips or tulip or buy shares in a tulip farm or shares in a tulip shop or whatever other than the fact that the price seemed to keep going up and so it seemed like a no-brainer it was just like well you know if I can earn my salary and just put it straight into tulips and I can pull it out a couple of days later and I'll have even more money. And so it just became this insane, like ever increasing tower of people pouring money into it. Um, but ultimately then when, when people started pulling their money out, loads of people were left holding a load of tulips that were worth nothing because why would a tulip be worth so much? Um, yes, Max, we're getting onto blockchain. I'm getting there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm getting there, sorry. Okay, the reason why it has these stripes is because of a virus. There's a virus that infects the bulbs, which obviously the people back in the, when was it, the 1600s didn't know about, because they didn't know about viruses back then. Um, but there was a virus that infected some tulip bulbs, and the tulips that were able to fight it off were scarred for the rest of their lives, and so they only produced partial pigments. So it's actually, it's damage, it's lasting damage from, from an infection when they were a bulb um, due to a virus. Um, so if you go, if you find yourself back in time and you need to make loads of money, then infect your tulip bulbs with viruses and go and sell them in the Dutch market and you'll do well. Right. Okay. So Bitcoin, um, this is the chart for the price of Bitcoin. Um, now I'm not sure how many people on this chat will own Bitcoin. Bitcoin or a fraction of Bitcoin or anything because I think you have to be over 18 to buy one um, or to buy a fraction of a Bitcoin but anyway this is what happened with Bitcoin. Bitcoin had this what at the time was a huge spike that lo loads of people made loads of money out of and then it crashed and then everyone thought Bitcoin's dead and everyone, everyone started ignoring it and then we move along and we get to here and the price started going up again and then there was a big spike and then it crashed out and everyone panicked again and then we got to here and it recovered and and so the price of Bitcoin kept rising because people really believed in it as an idea and this thing about Bitcoin that's quite strange is that like most of Bitcoin has grown because people believe in it as an idea and I'm going to talk to you about what it is and why, why it is why it's a valuable idea um, so the price of Bitcoin eventually around, um, yeah, it was late 2017, had this huge spike. And I remember um, I remember my um, brother and I had like bought a small, like really small amount of Bitcoin because we were just like playing around with it. Um, and our sister, um, who who is like really, she's really smart. She's a doctor and, um, and she's really on it with a lot of things. But when it comes to stuff like this she she like she's not so on it anyway it was around here that my sister came home and she was like hey guys um can you get me in on this bitcoin thing and we were like heather you haven't been looking into this so clearly if you are like if someone like my sister who is very smart but also is not really in this world of thinking about things like bitcoin the point at which she is suddenly starting to want to get in on it is the point at which it stopped being high value because it makes sense that it's high value and it started just being high value because everyone's getting in on it without having any idea really what it's about and that's why there was this huge spike and then this huge crash um anyway my sister didn't actually buy any bitcoin but we 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 sold some of our bitcoin there and then we sold the rest of it down here and we basically didn't make any money at all um <laughs> but anyway uh it was fun being a part of the movement because i really believe in the idea of what bitcoin is now does anyone know how much bitcoin is worth now one Bitcoin. What do you guys reckon? What is the price of one Bitcoin? And Jeff is saying that he has 0 0.00001 of a Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> Um, so Jasmine's saying a thousand, seven, uh, Max is saying seven thousand. It's exactly, it's about seven thousand five hundred. 
pounds at the moment for a single Bitcoin. Um, so I guess that's what, like $9,000 or something like that. Um, yeah, it's about £7,500 at the moment for a, for a Bitcoin. Um, yeah, Jeff, is that in pounds? I think that, I think that is in pounds. Although Jeff's put 75,000. No, it's not that high. I think it's 7,500. Um, yeah, so, so, so obviously up here it was, it was crazy expensive and it, you know, a single Bitcoin would cost like 15, thousand pounds or something but anyway you you can just buy tiny little fractions of a, of a bitcoin um right so what is a bitcoin <clears throat> um what what are they <clears throat> right so firstly if you're going to make a currency what are the important things that you need for the currency to work so for a currency to work what do you need what's the checklist of stuff that you need So you need people. You need people using it. Yeah. So you need you need users. You need to be non-hackable. Yeah. So like easy easy to own. Um, so or or control it. Um, and you need, yeah you need people to have faith in it. So you need users and you need people to to trust it. Um, you need to be able to own and control it. Um, these are all the same kinds of ideas. People to think it's valuable, yes. Um, that the the value kind of comes into the idea of trust. As long as people trust it as a store of wealth, it will it will become valuable. Um, the, there's one key thing. <laughs> Toby's class had a big argument about whether babies would be a good currency. I don't think babies would be a good currency, mate. Because how do you like you don't <laughs> no one's gonna trust. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be a mad world if people tr literally traded babies. Um, User-friendly is important. Um, and Max is saying blockchain again. We're going to get to what blockchain is. The key idea that you guys haven't said yet, which I, I was waiting for, is um, that it needs to be limited. It needs to be in limited supply. Because if if the currency is like salt, which actually it used to be, like Roman soldiers used to be paid in salt. Paid in salt. That's why it's called a salary sal from the latin roots for salt um so salt used to be a salary but imagine salt as, as money now people would be like well we'll just go to the ocean and just get money by just, just evaporating a load of ocean it would it would be madness but yeah you need you need it to be something something limited <coughs> so let's talk about where bitcoin comes from and i'm gonna this is going to be quite quite surface i'm not going to go i'm not going to go into the into the maths in any detail at all i'm just going to talk to you about the way that that computers solve things. So, so if you give a computer a problem, and you know that the an the answer is somewhere around here. So let's say this is just a list of numbers starting from zero and going up to ten. Um, <coughs> keep coughing. Um, the answer is, but uh, yeah, it's not a dry cough. So I'm okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so. If the answer is around here, then computers won't solve maths problems in the same way that we solve maths problems. They don't, they don't use exactly the same kind of methods. Instead, they do something that's called like an iterative process, which means, and I'm, this is going to be a bit of a cartoon, they basically guess. They're like, is this the right answer? And when it isn't quite the right answer, this gives them a kind of clue. So, so the fact that an answer exists somewhere on the number line, according, as far as the computer's aware, the answer kind of gives clues to the fact that it's nearby. And so if the computer guesses, if you give a computer a problem to solve, then it will um, solve it by guessing randomly. And let's say that the answer on the number line that the computer is looking for is here. Um, then the computer will try to solve the problem randomly by being like oh well let's try here and every time it makes a guess it will receive a clue and it'll be like oh well the answer's in that direction so it might guess here and then then it knows the answer in this direction and so every time it gets closer and closer to the real answer and it converges on the answer and this is basically how computers solve problems right however bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies were invented based on something called a hash function um, and again, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about how um, I don't I don't I, sh I don't know if they actually write it with a hash symbol. Um, but still, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. But I'll just explain to you briefly how it works. Um, so a hash function has solutions, 
And so in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is basically a huge hash function that has loads and loads of different solutions. And every single solution is a coin. Every solution of the Bitcoin problem, um, like the, the equation, is, is, a, is a Bitcoin or, or a fraction of a Bitcoin, um, depending on how they decide to divide it. So what this means is that in order to earn Bitcoin, in bracket, like where does it come from? You mine it. So people mine Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency by using a computer to solve the hash function. But the problem is the hash function does not work like a normal maths problem in that when the computer makes random guesses to try and decide, decide upon what the answer might be, the function gives no clues at all. So it's basically like trying to find gold nuggets in a cliff. Like being near a gold nugget does not tell you anything. You have to randomly strike a gold nugget. And so that's why you have to keep mining. And that's why it takes so much computer power to find all the Bitcoins. And so and the more you find, the harder it becomes to find other ones because you're running out of potential solutions. And it also means that there are limited numbers of Bitcoins because there can only be so many Bitcoins before, um, before you completely run out of them. So, uh, and uh, Max is saying, yeah, you have to go through all the numbers. Exactly. So, yeah, big, and um, Angel is asking if it's a mathematical function. Yes. Yeah, so cryptocurrencies are based on math functions and each and each each individual bit of the currency is, is an answer to the problem, which seems bizarre. But these problems are, are too hard for humans to solve, really, in, in any sustainable way. And so we use computers. And so you have this crazy situation where... Basically, as long as the currency is going up in value, then it makes sense to buy a powerful computer and have it on full computing power, just constantly trying to find answers. And as soon as you get to a point where the value gets bigger than the amount of money that you need to pour in to... Um, so yeah, as long as... Um, as soon as the value of the cryptocurrency gets higher than the computing power um, that you need in order to make... Um, in order to uh, mine out more of them, people just stop mining them out. And so essentially the, the number of possible Bitcoins is limited. And because they're limited, it makes it also easier for people to trust it as a currency. Limit allows people to trust it because they know that you can't just suddenly invent loads of them out of nowhere. Um, right, okay, so that's essentially like where, where these cryptocurrencies come from. Um, and yeah, that, that's essentially where these cryptocurrencies come from. Um, but uh, here's, a, here's a big worm. Have you, sorry, I know that some people find this really gross to look at, but this is a giant worm. Um, and I was going to just use this to kind of explain what the blockchain is, because uh, Max has certainly been saying, or is it Jeff is saying the blockchain? Someone keeps saying blockchain. Um, so yeah, let's talk about what the, what the blockchain is. Um, it is a good worm. I, once, I was once like sitting on a big piece of wood that then um, a huge worm, um, I realised there's a huge worm inside it of this kind of size like squirming around and uh, actually I thought it was quite nice because I like I like um, big worms every now and then. Um, a long boy. Um, okay so the blockchain is it's kind of like this. Now I'm going to explain it again as a bit of a cartoon um, to try and make it seem like a, a more simple thing. Um, and uh, you will, so essentially it's a series of, um, how do we, okay, <laughs> see, right. so, so the blockchain is, is a series of events that happen one after the other. So here's the idea, right, if you are a, um, if you are a bank, if you're running a bank and you want to commit fraud, then what you could do is you could just invent money out of nowhere or you could just take money from someone's account without really asking them and then you can change the records and pretend that none of it ever happened, right? And you can play with the numbers and as long as you're in charge of the bank, like you can do that because you control all of the, all of the information. Um, uh, Max is saying, is there a limit in the number of solutions? And actually, I don't know the answer to that, Max, but what I do know is that it becomes increasingly hard to find solutions. And so while it may be possible that there are an infinite number of solutions, the problem is because they're coming, becoming harder and harder to find, there is effectively a limit because it becomes too expensive to run the computing power to, to find more of the solutions. Um, anyway, so the blockchain works like this. Um, rather than a bank, which if they control all the information, they can just... Um, 
they can just like change records in order to, to commit fraud if they wanted to. And we trust that our banks don't um, for the most part, but they could theoretically. The blockchain is different. So every single transaction that happens in the entire world to do with, by, to do with Bitcoin will be stored on something called a blockchain that everyone will keep a record of. And it's called a distributed ledger is another word for it. So, for example, if you um, were to send me some, some uh, Bitcoin, then which you could do if you want, that'd be great. Um, if, if you would send that to me, then it would go on a central record that everyone would essentially be a part of because everyone's involved in the Bitcoin trade. Now, if someone else wants to do another transaction, so if I want to then send a transaction to my dog, for example, then I'm only allowed to make that transaction happen as long as my blockchain previous to that is completely up to date. Now, this blockchain does not only contain my transactions and your transactions, it contains transactions of every single person in the world. So someone from New Zealand could send some, send some money to someone in Japan um, and several thousand transactions could happen before I do my next transaction. And if I'm going to do another transaction, all of those transactions need to be stored in the same piece of information. And so what this means is that every single person within every transaction has, an, has a record, although they can't see where the, where the money's gone because it's encrypted in a certain way, but essentially encrypt, like encoded into every single transaction is a history of all transactions before it. And that's what's called a blockchain. So it's a chain of events that build up. Now, that means that if you wanted to go back in time and try and change this record where, and I'm like, oh, I actually didn't give any money to my dog, and you just want to write it back into your account and just pretend and hope no one notices, you can't. Because every single transaction following that has had the same record lodged in it. And so every transaction is absolutely encrypted in there and can't be undone. Um, and that's why blockchain is considered so secure and such a good way of running currency. And this is why, in many ways, that's why cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin have increased in price so much in the past and probably will do in the future. Um, maybe not Bitcoin itself, but maybe some other cryptocurrencies because they are, in essence, a very good idea. They're based on, they're based on a form of maths, which is fit for the kind of um, technological world that we live in. They're limited. Um, they can be controlled. You can trust them because they, um, they all fit together really nicely. Um, and I guess that one of the things... The what the one and uh, sorry and this is why I think like the value of, of cryptocurrency will will probably go up again as people as people realise that they are valuable things although maybe in a different way. Um, and Bromley's asking how does the transaction message grow to hold more and more information and that's a great question and it's one I actually don't know the full answer to but I know that somehow the transaction history is encoded and and maybe continually compressed um, although. And, and there is also, I, I never got myself fully around all of the maths, but I know that there is some element of the maths where the transaction processing fits in with the mining of new Bitcoin as well, because somehow people are rewarded with Bitcoin for processing transactions. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. Um, and Toby's talking about how easy it is to corrupt modern society because it is so fragile because it all depends on institutions that are trusted. Whereas blockchain does not need, you don't need to trust institutions because you know that the, that the maths cannot be corrupted. Um, and if it is corrupted by someone, then everyone else will be like, no, you've corrupted it. And everyone knows instantly. And there's no defense. It's just like, yeah, you've obviously made a, made a, made a cheeky transaction and it doesn't make any sense. Um, there is one thing that is less good about Bitcoin. What do you guys think? What 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 is a big what is a big weakness of Bitcoin? I recognise that during this live, I've just talked loads without asking many questions. Um, but yeah, I I want to know what you guys think about this. What what are the biggest problems with Bitcoin? And Jasmine is asking how much is one Bitcoin worth? So at the moment, one Bitcoin is worth seven thousand five hundred pounds. About. Um, so Bromley's talking about access to the currency as a problem. Although access to the currency would improve if it became more mainstream. There are ways of improving access to the currency. It's not too hard to get hold of Bitcoin at the moment. Um, Rebecca's saying you can't really use it to buy things. And you can use it to buy some things. But again, that's based on trust. 
And a lot of places are less willing to trust Bitcoin because they think, well, you know, we'll receive some Bitcoin now and what's to say in five days time it won't be worth way less. And so people don't trust it to be stable. So that's another thing is at the moment it's still kind of waving all over the place in its value. So people don't trust its stability. Um, and Merkers is saying about where is Bitcoin accepted? I've seen vending machines that you can pay with Bitcoin at um, and I've seen shops where you can pay with Bitcoin. It's, it's accepted in some places, places that are trying to be forward thinking because as we've just seen in the way we've talked about it, the ideas are very good. The idea is very good and that's why the price has gone up in the past. Someone once said to me that if there's something going on in the world that loads of nerds are really excited about and most people don't understand what it is, that's probably something that you should look into and get excited about as well, because that's it's essentially what cryptocurrency was uh, or is. It's, it's something that is it's a little bit complicated, but it's not too complicated once you start looking into it. And it makes sense as an idea. Um, OK, so Jasmine's talking about the fluctuations. Um, Angel is talking about people losing jobs in banks. So it became a major currency. I think I think loads of those jobs would, would still exist and they they'd transition. That's the thing, like, I, I don't. I think there's often an argument that's put forward in the world of, oh no, we shouldn't do this major change because loads of people will lose jobs. And actually, if you think about it, it doesn't really map with, with biology. Like biology is full of huge changes in, in history that then, um, that, that obviously a lot of people lose out, but then, but then things adapt. And I think what's more important is rather than saying we shouldn't do this because people will lose jobs, a better thing to say is we need to do this or we should do this and how do we help the people who, who will suffer in terms of their jobs to help them transition into the new areas that will exist? Um, which I think is one of those really important points. I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow, actually, when I talk about beef. Um, um, and Bromley's talking about there being several cases where the wallets are controlled by a server that still relies on trust. So yeah, it is possible that some, you can hold your own wallet or you can hold it on a server. Um, and some of the servers, again, theoretically could, could defraud you. But still, at least there is that ability to kind of take it, take it completely by yourself. Anyway, um, Toby's asking when I'm talking about beef. I'll explain that. I'll say that to you in a moment. But I just wanted to show you this because this is a huge stone wheel. It's like this big. Um, and this, this used to be a major form of currency. And this has one of the things that Bitcoin doesn't, which is that it lasts. And you know that it lasts because it's a huge piece of stone. The thing about Bitcoin is that what if... What if the whole of the internet fell apart and there was a big apocalypse and blah, blah. And I know a lot of money wouldn't really be worth anything in that case. But still, Bitcoin kind of depends on our technological, um, like technology staying, staying up and running. Whereas, you know, this big ring is going to be around even if everything collapses. Just in the same way that gold will be and silver will be and platinum will be. Um, and so, yeah, people generally reject fragility as something to use to store, store wealth. Um, I was going to talk here about fiat currencies, but actually I'm going to talk about that and monetary theory and what where money comes from in another live because it's so interesting and it's one of those things that you have to learn about. Someone really wise once told me that if you want to understand the world, you really have to understand the history of, of, of money first. And so one day I'll talk about that and I'll do like a history live at some stage. Um, but I think I should uh, pause here because I know this has been a bumpy ride and thanks so much for those who've, who've stayed with me through it. Um, this is the timetable of what's coming up next. If you want to tune in for what's for, for the next ones, um, I also I'm gonna yes yeah, so I'm gonna do a live about about money and what it actually means and like where it comes from. And I also want to do one about um, about quantum cryptography since we're talking about cryptocurrencies and about how you can send information with quantum mechanics and like teleport information from one place to another. Let me know if there's any subjects you'd like me to do, um, if there's anything else you'd like me to cover. Uh, do do like pour stuff into the chat or, or follow us on Instagram. If this is if this was your first time here, then do do check out our Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, it's all aim high live. Um, and do um, do tell your friends as well that we're doing this uh, because it is um, yeah as, as as I've said like we're we're a group of people who are doing this to to make something good out of the um, out of the out of the pandemic situation and to try and give people access to something that's more interesting than normal school. So do spread the word. Um, also check out the new website because it looks really really beautiful. Um, it's aimhigh.co if you want to see it. Um, and 
yeah, do, do follow this. And thanks so much for coming. And I will see you at one of these. Uh, I'm going to try and make some of Hannah's as well. Um, and thanks for coming. I'm just going to read the last bits of chat. Um, Angel, can we do more on finances? Yeah, mate. I'm going to do, I'm going to do one about fiat currency and money and stuff like that because it's so interesting. Um, oh, you want to do one on how investing works? Okay, I can do one on like investments and what all the investment tools are, I guess. Um, I will do that at some stage. Um, and Toby's asking when I'm talking about beef. That's this one here. Should schools ban beef? Um, and yeah, thanks so much for coming. Thank you for coming along with this bumpy ride. Uh, I'm sorry that it was so up and down, um, but uh, we'll we'll piece it together into a nice piece if anyone wants to watch it back. Uh, right, farewell all. See you soon. Bye bye.